welcome. This is Monica Patrick from the CHESS Program Development Team, and we'd like to thank you for attending today's CHESS webinar, Developing Smart Objectives for CHESS Annual Meeting Sessions. Doctors Hans Lee and Darlene Nelson will discuss why learning objectives are used and how to write them. This webinar is part of a series being provided by the CHESS Educator Development Subcommittee and the CHESS Education Committee to provide resources and support for the medical educator. This webinar will be recorded and we will provide a link to access the recording when it becomes available. Thank you to those who submitted questions in advance. If you have additional questions, please submit them in the chat window and they will be addressed as time permits. I will now turn the presentation over to our panelists. Well, hello and, and welcome and thank you for, uh, for your time uh, this evening. I'm Hans Lee. And I'm Darlene Nelson. <laughs> and welcome to our offices. And, <laughs> and we'll be talking about uh, the SMART objectives for the, uh, for the annual meeting. For those of you who don't know, I'm heralding from Rochester, Minnesota. And the weather is already starting to turn cold. And Hans, where are you coming to us from? I am in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, where actually today was very sunny uh, at the Johns Hopkins. Um, and I hope the weather is better wherever you are. Absolutely. So with today's session, uh, we would like to go over what, we, what we're what we going to accomplish, hopefully. Um, we have four objectives we're going to go through. The first is really to understand what is the purpose of learning objectives. A lot of times this can feel like a, just an exercise you have to go through, but is it actually useful? And why is it useful? And what is the purpose of them? Then we're going to describe different types and levels of learning objectives to help give a background uh, regarding them. We're going to demonstrate how to write them. And lastly, we're going to compare examples of learning objectives and hope that you walk away with some practical tools as you look to write objectives for your uh, chess session goals. So, uh, so we're going to make this a little bit inter interactive. And uh, our first question to the audience is, how comfortable do you feel writing uh, learning objectives for the uh, chess session? And uh, you can go ahead and uh, click in. OK, so it looks like we got a 50-50 mix almost. Yeah, And this is good. It means that hopefully you will all walk away with having learned something and be a little bit more confident hope to move you up on the bar. Okay. And so uh, a follow-up question, uh, what is your current role in involvement with uh, education? I think uh, this is to help us to get a better idea of who we're speaking to uh, tonight. Okay, all right. I think uh, the majority are physician educators and uh, some, uh, some are not, but might be interested in the uh, posing a session at the, uh, at the chess meeting next year, which is in uh, New Orleans. Can't wait to go. The big easy. <laughs> okay. Ah, good question. Why, why have learning objectives? Uh, they, they are important. Um, they, they'll help you focus the, uh, your curriculum or, or your session. And if we can have the next slide, really the, the point of the objectives is to kind of give you direction as to how you're going to uh, build your session or your curriculum. So it gives you a direction as to where you want to go, uh, prevents you from digressing too far off the, uh, off the topic. And it also helps your faculty, right? Your faculty may be coming from different states or different countries, and they may not have a, an appreciation of what you're envisioning for your session. Uh, so it kind of gives everyone, uh, puts them on the same track and the same page, and uh, helps you kind of really focus. There may be a lot of interesting things to talk about in a topic like pulmonary hypertension. 
but uh, you only have so much time and it just make sure that you really accomplish and streamline your sessions. The thing that we wanted to point out in talking about this is this really helps your learners pick whether or not they want to attend your session. So your objectives can really help them decide whether or not it's relevant to them in their practice or it's something they need to learn. Sometimes titles may not be descriptive enough to know what the talk is actually going to be about, uh, but your objectives really help them decide, uh, is this something that's useful for them? Um, and as Hans said before, it really helps you figure out how to design your session. So if one of your objectives is more uh, interactive, then you might want to choose some more an interactive format, not just having a, a talk, but it may be an interactive small group session or problem-based learning or other things based on what your objectives are. So your objectives really help not only uh, you plan your session, but then also helps your learners know where they're going and if they can benefit from coming to your session. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Darlene, about uh, uh, you know the people who will be attending your session or might not be attending your session. When I, when I go to CHEST, I flip through the uh, program, I see the title and I see the, uh, the objectives and then kind of quickly have to decide between competing programs about which one I'll attend. Uh, so definitely, it definitely is a marketing part of it uh, for your session as well. Right. Uh, so uh, when do you write your learning objectives? Uh, we'll, uh, we'll pull in. Uh, but my hopes is that uh, already by now you kind of appreciate maybe when to, uh, when to write them. I'm going to uh, bias this uh, particular question. All right, great. Um, so uh, almost everybody uh, writes it before uh, developing the session and presentation. Uh, a small percentage doesn't, but hopefully uh, by the end of this presentation, you'll really see how, uh, how it'll be helpful uh, from some of the examples that we'll go through uh, at the end of the session. Great. Okay, next slide, thanks. So goals versus objectives. Uh, you know, a lot of people use this interchangeably. Uh, I do for sure. Uh, but if we want to kind of really make the differentiation of these two, goals are usually big statements. They're visionary. They're inspirational. Uh, for example, uh, solving world hunger or curing cancer. Uh, they can be inspirational, right? You want to uh, jazz up your faculty and uh, motivate the audience. That's a great way to have a goal. They're very broad, maybe not accomplishable, especially in a 60-minute session. Uh, but the objectives are a little bit, more, a lot more precise. They're realistic, and this is really what you're going to get uh, or, or not get. But it's along the same lines of the idea of the uh, of the goals. Right. And so, in context of the chess session, you know, uh, a goal. You know, you may want to make everyone a, a knowledgeable regarding COPD and all of the new advances in treatment, but uh, that's probably too broad for your session. And so you, that's where your objectives can really ha help you hammer out what is it about COPD or about the lung nodule that you want your learners to walk away knowing. Go to the next slide. So with that, we'll build on that. There are different types of objectives, and most of what we're going to talk about in this webinar is really what are the learner objectives. It's important to recognize that um, there are knowledge objectives, which are the most common ones that we run across. These are also called cognitive objectives, where they are what we hope the learner will come away understanding or knowing, being able to apply. We also want to remember that there are different skills objectives. So this could be in relation to a procedural skill, but could also just be a skill in uh, terms of communication skill, or it could be an attitudinal objective, how you approach a difficult conversation or biases in the workplace or difficult um, interactions and team-based care. So not only can your objectives be based at the learner's cognitive status, but also their psychomotor and attitudinal. So objectives can be more than just uh, what is commonly thought of as the learner walking away with a better understanding of 
uh, lung cancer staging or whatever your topic of interest may be. There are some other broader objectives such as process objectives and this is really looking at the overall educational process so that would be more what the chess the, the directors of the chess meeting would look at what are their process objectives so that's beyond the scope of our talk today and then also patient and healthcare outcome objectives this would be more what your institution may be focused on um, or as if you're if you're involved in fellowship education some of the outcome objectives for your fellows uh, but again this is beyond uh, chess session objectives but just wanted to make you aware that there are different types of objectives. Next slide. Um, so here, this is a uh, curriculum that uh, I built out uh, a while ago, not for the chess session, but I thought it'd be a good example to kind of, you know, build on what Darlene just talked about, the different learner objectives. Now here we have a goal, which is to kind of develop this uh, uh, early career success of uh, graduating fellows, right? Uh, probably not all of them will succeed, but we want all of them to succeed. Um, but the objectives, you know, it's at the end of this course, very uh, time time based. Fellows would be able to understand the hiring process. Right? That's a cognitive objective. It's a it's a fact. It's a, a lot of recall. Uh, develop a job search strategy. That's a, a psychomotor objective because uh, here we're actually asking them to, to do something, right? Uh, another example is create a draft business plan, right? That's uh, also another psychomotor. Uh, something that's a little bit different, an attitudinal objective, demonstrate a deeper awareness of the barriers in professional development as demonstrated in a simulated job negotiation meeting. So that's a little different because we're trying to change maybe people's beliefs or, or attitudes uh, or opinions. So that's uh, another type of uh, an objective. So we have the cognitive psychomotor and, uh, and these attitudinal objectives. So another part of understanding objectives is looking at what's called the hierarchy of objectives. We'll talk a little bit more about this. But as we were just mentioning, there's different types of objectives. There's also a hierarchy in objectives. It's good to have your learners come away with increased knowledge. But what we're really trying to get them to do is have better patient and healthcare outcomes. Now, those are pretty broad and probably not attainable just for the chess sessions but we may be able to aim a little higher than just knowledge. So maybe we can aim at improving their performance about something, um, especially if it's a skills-based session or uh, working through um, different cases, or we can even uh, or look at attitudes and uh, competence um, regarding different subjects in pulmonary and chest medicine. So we would encourage you to not only think about knowledge objectives, but also how you can uh, develop your session to at not only skill but also performance. Yeah, and if you're a med ed ninja like myself and Darlene, uh, and you really want to read about all the objectives and Bloom's taxonomy and the hierarchy, this is one great book I would recommend. Uh, I think all med ed ninjas have this book. It's called Curriculum Development for Medical uh, Education, uh, and has a really nice uh, chapter on uh, on objectives. And I actually own the same book, but I couldn't dig it out of the... Um, she's a med ed ninja as well. <laughs> but I did want to show you a picture of something that's in the book, because I still have that on, you know, a Bloom's taxonomy. And so if you really want to get into this a little further, you can understand more about the hierarchy of objectives by looking at Bloom's taxonomy. So with that introduction, we'll talk about how one would go about writing objectives. and. One acronym that can help you uh, get into this a little further is the SMART acronym, and that's why we titled our webinar, um, How to Write SMART Objectives. And what SMART stands for, the first S is specific. And what you'd like to do is have concise, well-defined statements of what your learners will be able to do at the end of your session. You'd also like them to be measurable. So the goals of this objective would suggest how the student could be assessed if you were going to assess. Most of the time at chess, you're not gonna give them a, a test at the end. But if you uh, were going to, this writing goals with this in mind, or objectives with this in mind would then lend you to be able to assess your learners at the end if you wanted to. Uh, you also want them to be attainable. So students 
um, should have the prerequis prerequisite knowledge and skills for the objectives that you're putting out so that they can achieve them. You don't want to um, suppose that everyone is already an expert in uh, interventional pulmonology and then you're, you're uh, designing a session that is not applicable to them. They should also be relevant so the skills or knowledge described need to be appropriate for the course or program um, so not uh, not unrelated to chest medicine and then lastly they need to be time bound so it's nice to think lofty as we talked about initially but you have to recognize that certain you can only accomplish so much in an hour um, for your chest session proposal and so you need to make sure that your objectives are specific measurable, attainable, relevant, and also time bound. So one question I tend to ask myself when I'm writing objectives is this simple question, who will do how much or how well of what by when? And if you can answer every aspect of that question, you've pretty much written a smart objective. Yeah, I think that's a good way to kind of review your objectives just to make sure are you uh, as clear as you think you are. Um, I think it's a great way to kind of reevaluate uh, your objectives that you're submitting. Um, so when I was uh, starting off writing uh, objectives, uh, it was really difficult. I mean, I had these great, uh, great ideas, great topics, but I would write my objectives at the end because I knew they were the hardest. Uh, but one of the things that I, I did and I learned is to write them early, uh, but uh, also to use uh, good action verbs. And there's lots of these tables on the internet and different books. And what I would do is I would have an idea of what the objective should be. And I would use uh, these verbs that are listed here in this uh, column, depending on which type of objective I'm writing, and really use those, uh, use those verbs. So, any verb should have uh, some sort of uh, action verb and some sort of noun that helps both kind of describe some sort of performance or some sort of uh, action. Uh, and, and I think that if uh, you're writing sessions right now, I would uh, grab a table like this and just use those verbs. There's so many different verbs and they can be really colorful too. So I think it's a great way to spice up your uh, session. Just to build on what Han said, I just wanted to add one other thing. Make sure that your verbs are not too vague. You want them to be um, really describe what you hope to do. So instead of saying understand, you may want to say recall. Um, or instead of saying appreciate, you may want to say demonstrate. Um, or have it be much more specific about what you're hoping the learner will be able to accomplish. So then we just wanted to run through some examples. Um, so this was an example actually just from the most recent chest uh, meeting that occurred in Austin. So the session was titled EBIS, what you need to know in your practice. And it had three objectives. The first one being to incorporate appropriate full mediastinal staging into clinical practice, understand guidelines in technique and staging with EBIS, and then to utilize the new findings in EBIS literature in critical clinical care. And so um, these objectives were fairly specific and uh, defined as to EBIS, so not all of bronchoscopy or not all of um, lung cancer. They uh, could be a little bit measurable. Uh, some of the verbs, if we want to be really picky, could have been a little bit more specific, but I think um, overall this is a fairly specific and yet uh, attainable objective that was, uh, could be accomplished in an hour. Yeah, I think maybe if I if I was going to try to improve it, uh, I think there are some ways to do it. Um, and I think it's really helpful for maybe uh, your faculty to incorporate some of these things in the objective. For example, the first objective about incorporating full mediastinal staging, uh, one thing that you may consider is um, if you're using some sort of checklist or a table, you could say, incorporate mediastinal staging into clinical practice using uh, the checklist or paper uh, provided in the session. Excellent point. So another example here, um, this was off of the CHEST website of uh, examples for session proposals. The title was A Systematic Approach to the management of massive hemoptysis. And again, the objectives um, 
are fairly specific, define and, and etiolo the etiology of massive hemoptysis and review of diagnostic approach. Also early management and stabilization and then treatment strategies. If we wanted to potentially improve on this, um, you may want to say, you know, by the end of this session, the learner will be able to, um, you know, define massive hemoptysis and um, demonstrate a systematic or a diagnostic approach, you know, so have it be more uh, measurable versus just to review, because remember, review is just a recall, and we're trying to move our learners beyond recall, but actually to understanding and application. Yeah, so there's one uh, cognitive uh, uh, feedback, uh, objective, and there's a back motive. I think uh, perhaps if you're providing some sort of a tool again, uh, you can incorporate that into your. Uh, so here was another example off the chest website that was looking at pulmonary disorders and air travel. And the objectives, um, identify physiologic changes, uh, understand screening process, and understand various pulmonary disease-specific recommendations. And while these are um, a defined objective that may be um, appropriate, to improve on this a little bit, you could maybe use more actionable verbs. Instead of just understand, you may ask your learners to describe or explain identify, summarize, something where they're um, demonstrating understanding of the concept, like demonstrating it versus just saying that they're gonna understand it, because that's really hard to, to measure um, or to know if they actually accomplished it. Yeah, I mean, all, all three are cognitive uh, objectives, and uh, I think the, the table with verbs could be helpful. You can see you can see understand, understand, and objectives two and three. Uh, I think you could probably mix it up just to make it more interesting. Sorry, I think I'm getting a little feedback on my mic. So we had, you can go to the next slide. We had um, two session sets of objectives that were submitted for feedback, and we really appreciate those who did that. Um, so thank you that we can continue to give some, hopefully some helpful feedback for your, your objectives that you're trying to plan for your upcoming session, uh, chess submission. So the first one was the value, um, Evaluation Survival Guide, valuing, valuing the work of PCCSM clinicians. And the objective one was to learn sources of revenue and be able to apply by optimizing compensation and fairness for the individual practice or division. Meeting this objective will result in a change in performance. And I, uh, I applaud the submitters for um, their lofty goal and also for um, helping, you know, having a good idea of exactly what they want to accomplish one way to potentially improve this objective would be to try to narrow it down just a little bit um, and also think about how it could be measurable. So if, if we're going to result in change in performance, in what aspect of change in performance is it um, you're, you're under, um, how you're going to uh, be able to apply this? Uh, is it providing them with a, uh, a specific uh, set of instructions that can help them um, look through the compensation rules or guidelines for that, um, so or a table or other resource management. So, because it's a very uh, broad objective, though important objective, and so that would be one uh, tip for maybe improving it. Yeah, I, no, I, I agree with you, Darlene. I think um, also, you know, don't be afraid to put in more objectives. Uh, I don't know why we we kind of feel two is too few and three is probably acceptable. But uh, I, I think uh, for this session, it seems like there's a, a lot of things that uh, can be added. Uh, so I, I would go ahead and add a fourth objective. And uh, uh, and that way, maybe you can shorten some of the other objectives and uh, it, it'll be a little bit more eye grabbing when people are reviewing your uh, particular session. Also, um you know, this, I really liked this session, but when you, um, when it says improve the clinical, clinical integration of all members of the team by improving a team-based focus, it may be helpful to figure out exactly um, 
how you're going to do that, it maybe make the objective a little bit more specific. So is that um, by integrating which members of the team? Is it um, your your billers or is it your nurses or is it your allied health staff? Who specifically are you focusing on? And then um, what competence and patient outcomes are you looking at? Because uh, it sounds it sounds impressive and just uh, want to be able to understand exactly what the organizers are trying to accomplish. Yeah, I, I think, uh, um, well, we can move on, but uh, I, I think there's probably room for an attitudinal uh, objective there and where people in the audience can start to appreciate or value the importance of uh, certain components of that session. So I, I would encourage uh, the person to add another objective uh, because there's a lot of things there that I would like to learn for sure. Uh, and I think if you put it there in the objective, it may be uh, just a little bit clearer for your speakers and uh, for your audience. So uh, this is uh, another uh, uh, submitted uh, uh, topic for, uh, for uh, our feedback. And, uh, you know, I actually really do applaud this person as well. This person is, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, a, a pulmonary fellow, so you know, kudos for uh, submitting a, a session at at chest, uh, and, and it's a topic that uh, that I like pulmonary nodules. Um, uh, but uh, here it's it, it's kind of kind of wordy. We we don't have um, uh, objectives kind of clearly uh, listed in there, but I think they are in there. Uh, but I think this is where if again if you figure out what the topic is and then write the objectives, it'll go a long way with, you know, uh, writing the rest of the uh, proposal. Um, so I think here, you know, for example, uh, I don't know, Darlene, if you have any suggestions, uh, but one of mine is, you know, uh, go ahead and put a, a, a psychomotor objective, you know, talk about uh, maybe risk assessment. Um, you know, learners will, by the end of the session, uh, be able to risk assess pulmonary nodules using a nodule calculator uh, and uh, demonstrated in this session by a, an example. Uh, that, that may be one particular uh, uh, objective. Another, thanks Hans, I think that's a really good point. And another thing I was thinking of when I was reading through this um, session proposal was this is something that I commonly find myself doing. I get excited about an idea, and then I let the methods almost run away before I know what I want to accomplish. So if you read further down, um, it talks about how presentation and divided into groups, and you look at cases, and sometimes we choose the methods before we have our objectives outlined, and what you really need to do is have your objectives and let your objectives guide your methods not the opposite way around. Um, but sometimes it's so fun to think about different educational methods that we tend to say, oh, I just want an interactive case presentation about lung nodules. Well, is your um, is that the best method for getting your message across? And that really just depends on what your objectives are because your um, what you set out your objectives then um, defines the methods. I it sound like a broken record there, but one right. of the in that book that Han showed everyone is um, it gives a list of educational tools or ideas based on the type of objective you're aiming for. So if you're looking at a cognitive type of objective, it says think about these methods. If you're looking at a psychomotor or an attitudinal objective, it says think about these methods. And so um, again, just emphasizing that the objectives set the direction for your course. Um, and not the other way. Right, and, and the first line is, uh, you know, propose a postgraduate course or an interactive session. Um, and if you, if you write out the objectives as to what you'd like to do um, about lung nodules, you may find, boy, you know, this is too much for a, a 60 minute session. Maybe I need a 90 minute session, or maybe I need the whole day, I need a postgraduate course uh, just to go, uh, um, to kind of accomplish all the objectives. So, um, you know, I, I would encourage you to go ahead and write these smart objectives, maybe in the format that we proposed, and, and let that guide uh, the rest of your uh, proposal. But I again applaud you for submitting this because it's a, um, 
certainly lung nodules are a very relevant topic to every pulmonologist, and I think there would be a lot of interest in the session. So. Right. Um, and uh, here's just uh, another uh, word of encouragement uh, to go ahead and uh, submit your topics for CHEST and submit multiple submissions. The deadline is uh, November 30th. And uh, I think uh, it's, it's really a, a great process. Once you've uh, done it uh, a few times, it just gets easier and easier to, uh, to write and submit these. And we are definitely open to take any questions. I'm not sure if anyone has anything they'd like to write in. Yeah, absolutely. If you have any questions or comments or anything that we can clarify, please uh, please write in and uh, Monica will go ahead and put that on our boards for us to see and uh, respond. Uh, I do have a, a cameo guest appearance by a very special medical educator. It wasn't easy to get him here, uh, but he was a big proponent of active learning. And uh, would you mind coming out here? Uh, it's Confucius, hello. Hello, so 500 BC, he was a, a big proponent of uh, active learning and learning by doing. Uh, I think some of the uh, uh, topic uh, themes of uh, the next uh, chess meeting. So um, if you're uh, interested in, uh, in submitting a session, I think uh, submitting a session with something along those lines and objectives, uh, I think may, may go over uh, pretty well. So, um, I'll take, I guess we'll take uh, any questions. All right, well. Dr. Yes, Dr. Lee and Dr. Nelson, we have one question that came in and it is asking, is there an interest for how to do a literature search? Uh, as far as, uh, as a webinar, um, I, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, if it's for uh, actually developing a kind of a curriculum or for a, uh, a part of the session, I, I think that's an even better idea as well. You know, the first part of uh, writing any type of curriculum is uh, doing a need assessment. And uh, many times um, uh, that information is already out there in the, in, in the literature. And so, uh, doing a good literature search uh, is, uh, is is very important. Uh, if you're not sure how to do one, uh, a lot of hospitals have librarians, and they've been a great a great resource for me as to how to do a, a, a good literature search. Yeah, I echo what Han said. Um, I tend to go to our librarians quite often, and we'll just ask them to help me make sure I did a comprehensive literature search. And um, since this is what they do, they tend to get back to me relatively quickly with a long list of articles that I may or may not have seen just in my initial uh, searching on uh, PubMed or other uh, web-based resources, so. Yeah, and if you want to do a, like a precursor uh, literature search, there's PubMed, there's Dr. Google. Um, those are quick and easy places to start and uh, right before you go to the librarian just to see how much is out there or, or, or not out there. Okay, I think we have a, another question coming in, Monica. Yes, so we have a question. Um, I want to think about a session on post-biologic therapy for asthma, looking at development of neutralizing antinodes, duration of benefit and when to repeat relevant studies. Would love to hear your opinion about proposing that topic. Yeah, I think it's great. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, no, it, it is, uh, I, I think it's a good topic. It's, it's novel, it's new. I think a lot of that is gonna depend on how you present it, right? Because these uh, sessions get submitted uh, and then they get uh, voted on by the uh, different uh, steering committees. Um, so I, I think the, the key is, I think it's a, it's a good topic, um, and, but it, the key is to, to, to propose it uh, in the best way possible. I don't know, Darlene, if you have any thoughts of some ideas of how to do this? Yeah, I, I, again, I think it's a great topic. Certainly um, anything that's a new 
uh, therapeutic agent. Uh, many of us who I personally don't do a lot of asthma in my clinical practice, and so I love going to chest to get caught up sometimes on some of the newer uh, things that have come out regarding that. And I, I would echo what Hans said. A lot of it, in terms of whether or not it uh, will be accepted, will be based just on how you present the idea. And I would encourage you to uh, make objectives that are really clear and communicate uh, what you would like to accomplish, help them try to think of ways you can get beyond just the knowledge, um, but also getting to the applying and synthesizing and application aspect of learning. And then see if you can't um, involve uh, the panelists or people from multiple institutions. Uh, that also tends to bring in some diversity of opinion and helps make sessions a little bit richer. So. Yeah, I think because it, it's it's kind of novel, it's it's new. You're 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 definitely going to probably have a cognitive objective, like people like me. I I don't know much about it, so having some information for me to regurgitate as to what it is probably is important. Uh, but because it's also new, and anything that's new, you may want to do an attitudinal objective because, you know, do I do I see the value of the research of this? Do I see the value of how this might be helpful for, for my patients, uh, because it's probably not yet in the, in the guidelines, right? Uh, thirdly, you may be able to provide some sort of a checklist or, or some sort of a table that gives you an idea of how to potentially uh, apply this type of treatment or potentially how to uh, do research in this particular, uh, in this particular area. And so that can be a, a psychomotor objective, like, um, you know, uh, learners in this session will uh, be able to describe a, a clinical scenario for using this therapy uh, based on uh, the following, you know, criteria for patients, patient use. Uh, I think something like that, if you put something like that as an objective, your uh, faculty will inevitably kind of try to focus on, okay, how do I take what's printed in the literature into clinical practice. Um, so that, that, that might be a, a, a one way to do it. It looks like another question came in. Uh, it says, keeping objectives as specific as possible seems to be the right approach. What about year in review type of sessions? And um, it's a great question. So year in review are definitely a little bit broader and they're focused on cognitive objective, objectives. I guess I would encourage those who are doing those type of sessions to focus not just on remembering the, um, the knowledge, but, all, but maybe focus a little bit more on applying and analyzing the knowledge. So part of what the year in review is helpful for is being able to compare and contrast the different studies and um, help your learner sort through my, what might be important and what's not important. Because it can be hard when you get bombarded by all these different studies to know which uh, know which ones really should change your clinical practice and which ones um, maybe had some deep methodological flaws that weren't apparent just on first pass. Um, so while they may still be more cognitive because it's a larger session and harder to get people doing active learning in that, you could uh, try to keep people involved by potentially using ARS or other things like that, but then really just focus on cognitive objectives that are at least a little higher up in the um, Bloom's taxonomy that would focus on analyzing, applying, uh, evaluating the literature or the year in review would be what I would encourage. Yeah, no, I, I agree with Darlene. And just like the uh, the last question, anything that's new, um, definitely there's cognitive, I think definitely attitudinal and uh, find some way to get the person to to use it in some way, very specifically. And oftentimes with these new uh, papers that you're reviewing, they, the, uh, the authors of these papers usually give you some idea of how it could be used or how was it used in the study. Uh, and then that's maybe part of your objective to, to describe that. Um, I, I think we have another question about uh, good resources for examples of writing curriculum. I, I can't recommend this book. <laughs> <laughs> Enough. I, I don't get any royalties whatsoever. I, I bought it on Amazon. So if you if you, if you get this book on Amazon, you know what? This was a great cheat sheet for my master's program uh, because it gave me lots of examples, lots of action verbs, uh, a lot of different ways of how to 
improve my objectives. They even give you examples of how to improve it. Uh, I don't think it was that much. Uh, oh, hey, it's just, there's a price tag on the back of my book. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, well, that's how much I paid. Um, <laughs> but it's it'll stay on my bookshelf forever. Uh, and literally, it will. So, uh, you know, I, I cannot uh, recommend that book enough uh, because it goes into curriculum, not just objectives. And I think Darlene can uh, 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 give her opinion on it, too. But uh, it, it takes you through the whole spectrum of how to do a program. Yeah, I do echo what Han said. It's a very useful book in terms of trying to approach uh, any sort of curriculum you may be planning. So if it puts you, it looked like most of our audience is uh, physician educators. And so if you're in charge of developing a new curriculum for a rotation, maybe in the ICU or um, on the consult service, um, and you, you first, it runs you through a whole bunch of questions first to ask. Try to um, understand exactly what you're trying to do before you just again let the cart get ahead of the horse and you're not uh, actually addressing the problem that needs to be fixed. So it's a great uh, hands on tool. I would also say if um, you know, you're know you realizing that you may not uh, get that book because you're not going to be a med ed uh, ninja like Hans. And <laughs> Everyone could be a med ed ninja. <laughs> um, yeah. I've found a lot of good resources just online too. There's a lot of um, institutions that have put out med ed resources. Um, if you're a part of the Association of Program Directors for Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, they have a lot of resources on learning objectives um, it, on their website as well. So I would just encourage you to uh, look around, but I've, I've found some of their resources useful too. Yeah, and there's a lot of resources uh, on CHEST as well. And I think uh, as time goes on, you'll see more and more programs like this on the uh, on the CHEST website. Uh, you can uh, rewind and play and hear me and Darlene talk over and over about this. Uh, so, you know, check out the, uh, the CHEST website as well for additional objectives. I think there are a couple of questions already kind of coming in. I think one that already kind of passed was, uh, what about proposing things that were uh, old? Uh, or has been forgotten. I, I think those are good. You know, what's old is new, and I think our guest faculty would uh, would agree, right, Confucius? Yes, he says yes. Um, yeah, no. Um, what's old is new is absolutely uh, uh, the the truth. Uh, uh, Confucius in 500 BC was promoting active learning, and here we are uh, over 2,000 years uh, uh, pr promoting the same thing. So if you have something that's forgotten, that's great. Absolutely, propose it. Um, There's and, another. Uh, yeah, go okay. ahead, darling. I was gonna say that it looks like the question came in on involving faculty from different institutions. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, for me, what I've done is that at chess meeting itself, as I get ideas, I talk to other people I meet there and then ask them if they're interested. But, you know, sometimes if you know someone, I would just reach out on email. Um, figure out someone maybe in the chess networks who has the same interest as you. Um, you could certainly send out an email to the steering committee and see if they have people uh, who they know who might be interested in a topic. Um, but I would reach out to your network people to help. Um, Hans, do you have any other tips on that? Yeah. So when, when you propose a session, I think um, I, I think uh, it's it, it's a good idea to have some diversity, right? Uh, involve uh, different points of views people from different institutions. Uh, if there's a paper that you liked uh, and, and that author um, uh, is in the same field, then maybe you can invite that particular author. The worst thing that can happen is they, they say no, and uh, then you just move on to the next person. Uh, but, uh, and, and, and there are a lot of, I think, really, really good speakers out there. Um, you know, and sometimes if you know one person, they'll know someone else. Um, so don't don't be afraid to not hand in a session uh, because you don't uh, you don't know anyone specific for that uh, for that particular topic. Um, certainly, uh, you can reach out and, and, and find someone as well. Uh, let's see. You said, uh, Dr. Lee. I think you said you used the book for your master's. Curious what your master's degree is in. Yeah, uh, it is actually in uh, Masters of uh, Education for Health Professionals. Uh, and I think Darlene's involved in that uh, same type of a program, but at a different institution. Yep, mine's just called Masters for Health Professions Education. We just like to flip the letters around. <laughs> 
Yeah, so I, I really like school. <laughs> Darlene does as well. So we're we're uh, we're eternal students. Yes. <laughs> One of my children asked me how many years I'd been in school, and I think we counted up uh, 33. So that's uh, pretty sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, and I still do homework with my kids sometimes, uh, and, uh, and and they kind of call me when I take these breaks. So uh, you're you're never too old to learn. Well, we'd All like right. to thank you for tuning in. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you found this uh, useful, and we're uh, uh, we're glad that Chess gave us the opportunity. So, great, thanks, thanks as well. Have a good night. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee and Dr. Nelson, for your great presentation, and thank you everyone who attended. Uh, this is just your one last reminder that the deadline for call for topics is November 30th, and you can find more information on that at chestnet.org. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening.